a protocol, the Hebron Protocol, and in 1996 concluded the negotiations with the US, Lebanon, Syria, and France for the creation of the Monetary Group of Southern Lebanon. In 1991, he had served as an advisor to the Israeli delegation to the Madrid Peace Conference. From 85 to 96, he was a senior research associate at the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University, where he was director of the US Foreign and Defense Policy Project. If we go back further, he got his BA, his MA, and his PhD from Columbia University. He's written many books and articles on the Middle East, including more recently Tower of Babel, How the United Nations Has Fueled Global Chaos, The Fight for Jerusalem, Radical Islam in the West, and the Future of the Holy City, and most recently, The Rise of Nuclear Iran, How Tehran Defies the West. His articles have appeared in innumerable newspapers, notably the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and most notably, it doesn't say here, the Jerusalem Post. It does say the Jerusalem Post, it just doesn't say most notably. <laughs> okay, so Ambassador Nori Gold will speak to the motivation behind the Israel apartheid South Africa, South Africa analogy. Who advocates this position? This position and to what end? Ambassador Gold, please. Anyone who knows the history 
of Jewish nationalism, of the Zionist movement, we know we are far from anything that's related to colonialism. But we are an authentic national movement. You know, even if you go back to the 1922 mandate for Palestine, approved by the League of Nations, the mandate didn't create some new right of the Jewish people to this land. The mandate didn't come forward and say, okay, we the colonial powers who won the First World War are now creating a right for this people. If you read the mandate carefully, what you see is that it states recognition has been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home. What does that mean? What that means is that the international community after World War I recognized a pre-existing right of the Jewish people to this land. It wasn't as though the imperial powers said, okay, now we're going to have this other little colonial entity in the uh, for a little piece of the former Ottoman Empire. It was a pre-existing right. And that's why they could use the language to reconstitute their national home. Moreover, anyone who knows the history of the Ottoman of the return of the Jews to their ancestral homeland, knows that Jews were streaming here well before the imperial powers got involved here. We know that when was the Jewish majority established in the Jewish Rock? In Jerusalem? Whenever I ask that question, the speech is overseas. You, know, you get people saying, oh yeah, 1967. And you get people say, no, 1948. Well, when I wrote this book on Jerusalem, I sent one of my researchers to the British archives, and we found a cable from the British Consul General in uh, Jerusalem to London saying there was a Jewish majority in 1863. The cable was a cable from 1864. Well before the riot, well before the British Empire got to this part of the world, well before even the establishment of the Zionist movement, the Jews streamed back to their ancient capital. It had nothing to do with what was going on in Europe. It had everything to do with deep Jewish national motivation. Now, of course, the other element that makes this whole notion that the Jewish attachment to this part of the world is, comes from colonial roots, preposterous, is the fact that most of the modern state system in the Middle East is connected one way or another to the involvement of the imperial powers. Had it not been that the French, particularly the British, had come into the Ottoman Empire and broken up Turkish hegemony in this part of the world, there would never be an Arab state system. There would never have been modern Saudi Arabia. There would never have been countries like Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. They emerged, actually, because of the involvement of the imperial powers. In the case of the states of the Persian Gulf, those uh, Arab sheikhdoms were recognized by British India in formal treaties in which the leaders were recognized by British India to be sovereign in those little statelets and in exchange they gave away their uh, external sovereignty in the British Empire. But that's forgotten. All these states band together in the UN General Assembly and try and talk about the colonialist connection of Israel. And of course anyone who's at all acquainted with modern Israeli history knows that back in 1948, who trained and armed the Arab states that went to war against us? It was the British and the French. It got to a point that at the very tail end of uh, our war of independence, the nascent Israeli Air Force actually went into air combat against the Royal Air Force of the British over Sinai. We fought the imperial powers. The British, excuse me, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, and the Syrians relied on them. But that somehow swept under the rug.